Okay, so we are going to rewind to Elizabeth Benley, who's the last prosecution witness. She was mid-testimony, okay, and now the defense team's lawyer gets to question her and cross-examine. So, Mr. Block, whenever you're ready, do you want me to be you until you're ready? or you I, I get it. Okay, you ready? Here's your mic. You guys can, if you just stand right next to him and talk into it. Have someone who's your group stenographer. I'll bring the transcript up on my screen. Here we go. Now, you have referred to a man by the name of Jacob Gallos. He was known to you as also John. John was the name he used with his undercover contact. His real name was Jacob Nathan Gallos. And what name did he use to you? Well, when I first met him for the first year, I knew him as Timmy. After that, I knew him by his real name. What name did you call him? You mean personally? Yes. I called him Yasha. You were pretty friendly with him, weren't you? I think I've said this in other trials. I was in love with Mr. Golos. Did you live with him? Did you not? I certainly did. Did you know that Golos was married at the time you started to have relations with him? Mr. Golos was never legally married to any woman in his life. Any other woman had the same relationship I had. He did not believe in bourgeois marriage. He was a communist. Bourgeois. Bourgeois. It's okay, your French is rough. Bourgeois. Would you characterize your relationship with Mr. Gallos as being the mistress of Mr. Gallos? I don't feel I'm called upon to characterize it. That's up to you. Did you know that Mr. Gallos had a child when you started to have relations with him? I knew that Mr. Gallos had lived with a, mo a woman previously who had gone back to the USSR two years before, and that he had had a child by her, yes. Did you recognize the voice of the man who Should you I say see. called you up and said, this is Julius? No, I've never met anyone whose voice I heard, whom I could, whom I could identify as Julius. How many times in all, you, in all do you say this person who called you up and said, this is Julius? It might have been five or six, it may have been more. And during what period of time was this? I think I've stated that. It was from the fall of 42 to about November of 43. Can you tell us more specifically when these calls came in? Yes, they always came after midnight in the wee small hours. Uh, I remember because I got waked out of bed. Did you always <coughs> ask the people who called you their names? If I didn't get the voice right off, but this particular party always started his conversation by saying, this is Julie. This is Julius. Yes. That was on six or seven occasions. I put it at five or six. It might be seven or eight. I don't know exactly the number of them. Okay. Thank you. Now, if you see what the defense attorney is trying to do, he's trying to discredit the witness by saying, you're sleeping with this guy that you're testifying about, and you're like his mistress, like, his girlfriend on the side, because he's already got a baby Sorry. mama, to put it in your guys' terminology, right? What is <laughs> That's the spy that she said connects her and Julius. Okay? Now, everyone has the right to plead the Fifth Amendment, especially at your trial. Mr. Graham, you'll get that earbud out of your ear, or I will take it from you. Thank you. If your lawyer advises you to, can you stand up at your own trial and testify? Yes. Yes, but if your lawyer tells you not to or you don't want to, can you just sit quietly and not talk at your trial? Also, yes. Yes. I advise you to have a good lawyer and do what he says. Mr. Rosenberg has been advised by his lawyer to testify. Here's your microphone. This is one of two defendants because his wife, Ethel, is... The co-defendant, I remind you, you'll be writing their son a letter when we're done today. You're so a communist. Closely. Now, Mr. Rosenberg, are you aware of the charge that the government has leveled against you? I am. Do you know what you are being charged with? Yes. What are you being charged with? Conspiracy to commit espionage to aid a foreign government. Now, I want you to direct the following questions try to have you focus your attention upon your recollection of their testimony. Ms. Ruth Greenglass testified here in substance that in the middle of November 1944, you came over to her house or you invited her to your house and you asked her to enlist her husband, Dave Greenglass, in getting information out of where he was working and delivered to convey that information to you. 
Did you ever have any conversation with Miss Ruth Green Glass, or at or about that time with respect to getting information from Dave Green Glass out of the place that he was working? I did not. Did you know in the middle of November 1944 where Dave Green Glass was stationed? I did not. Did you know in the middle of 19, November 1944 that there was such a project known as the Los Alamos Project? I did not. Do you owe allegiance to any other country? I do not. Have you any divided allegiance? I do not. Would you fight for this country? Yes. In, in this discussion of merits and former and forms of government, I discussed that with my friends on the bias of the performance of the accomplishments, and I felt that the Soviet government was and provides a lot of underdog there, has made a lot of progress in eliminating and literacy has done the reconstruction and built up a lot of resources and uh, at the same time felt that they were contributing, uh, they contributed a major share in destroying Hitler's beast who killed six million by co assailants and I'm emotional and I feel emotional about that thing. So Rosenberg testified as to his version of the conservation he had with the Green Glass during the walk that he took shortly before Green Glass was arrested. Rosenberg said that during their walk, Green Glass demanded $2,000. According to Rosenberg, Green Glass claimed Julius owed him for their failed business venture. I can be support. And you can't think of any reason whatsoever, can you, why David Green Glass would, of all the people he knew, his brother, all the other members of his family, single you out, as he did apparently, and as you say he did and say that you would be sorry unless you gave him the money. Well, he knew that I owed him, and he had an idea that I owed him money for the business, and I guess that's why he figured he wanted to get money from me. Just one last question. Did you ever have any arrangement with Dave Greenglass or Ruth Greenglass or any Russian or with your wife or with anybody in this world to transmit information to the Soviet Union or any foreign power? I do not have any such arrangement. Okay, thank you. Now remember, does the defense get to call their own witnesses? But, you guys get to ask questions of their witnesses, just like they did of yours. So, Mr. Rosenberg, you're still going. You're going to get cross-examined. If you just want to stand next to him, wherever you can see from. Can you see from back there okay? So the very bottom, uh, uh, I can do the parentheses part and then you'll go. Rosenberg was asked about his previous association with the Lichter, that's Max, the first guy we heard from. And Rosenberg responded that they had known one another slightly during their college days. Okay. Um, you told us about Green Glass talking, taking you for a walk and demanding $2,000 from you. Did you tell your wife about this? Yeah, she wanted to help me even though I would, even though we should not after she tried to blackmail me. Uh, and then four years later when you were in Washington you decided, decided that you wanted to call him and pay him a visit. That's right. Well, what is it that you wanted to see him about? I was lonesome and I wanted to see somebody to talk to. And, for, and out of the clear sky, he looked in the cell phone back under E for the name, name of Lake Drain, you called him out. <clears throat> Sir Saple, I was looking in the phone book for any names that I could recognize as a former classmate or people that I knew at the time. Uh, what names were you looking for? For some names I recognized. You mean you started with A and started going? No, I did not just start with A. I, I know a couple of names who might have been, been in Washington. I remember the incident of swimming pool at the time and that Esther was in Washington and perhaps he had a telephone. Saipul asked Rosenberg why he had not called other people with whom he had worked on work in Washington. I did not know them socially. Do you know a lecture socially? No, but he had been a former classmate. Rosenberg was asked about his domestic from his job in the United U.S. Single Corps in 1945. What really happened to you? You were dismissed, were you not? I was suspended. Uh, when, when you then, were you then dismissed? That is correct. 
And what was the reason? I was alleged that I was a member of the Communist Party. It is not a fact on the occasion that you were told you were being removed from the government service because of the fact that information had been received that you were a member of the Communist Party. I cannot recall the date exactly. Can you recall the fact of being advised that the information that you were a member of the Communist Party was imparted to you? I was down at the Cap Captain Henderson's office in one occasion. It is not a fact that on any occasion you were told you were being removed from government service because of the fact that information had been received that you were a member of the Communist Party. You guys chime in, Mr. Block. Can you see my screen? Um, right no. here is you. I got that. I lost it. Should be Mr. Sable wants a confession. If Mr. Sable wants a concession, I will concede right now that this witness was removed from government service upon charges that he was a member of the Communist Party. All right. Were you a member of the Communist Party? I refuse to answer on the ground that it might incriminate me. Dirty Communist. Does he have the right to not answer that question? Yeah. Yeah. There's not a fact in, He's that in February 1944, you transferred from Branch 16B of the Industrial Division of the Communist Party to the Eastern Club of the First Assembly under transfer number 12179. I refuse to answer. Dirty Communist. Uh, do you think you should have volunteered it to them? Well, when a member of the family is in trouble, Mr. Sapol, you're not interested in sinking him. Why is he saying that? Because Mr. Greenglass is his brother-in-law. Is he mad that he testified against his, his brother-in-law and his sister and might get him killed? Yeah. yeah. Were, you tr were you trying to protect him at that time? Well, I didn't know that I did not know what he what was accused of, Your Honor. I was suspended I was suspicious that he was accusing of stealing some uranium at the time. Well in connection with that were what are, were you interested in protecting him? I wasn't interested in doing him any harm at that particular point. You're not answering the question if you were interested in protecting him. Not in protecting that act itself, but protecting the individual. To point where you, to that, to, to the point where you, were where you would not reveal something which you felt. Well, I wasn't asked a particular thing, but I was asked that particular thing, and there was nothing for me to reveal. I wasn't aware of the trouble he was in. <sighs> that was very last for you to. Well, I read about the Harry Gold case. Uh, you read about the Klons Fuchs case, too? That is correct. You knew David Greengrass had been questioned in February by an agent of the FBI regarding the theft of uranium, didn't you? That is correct. Where did you find that out? David told me. And you still say that you had no suspicion where the agents questioned you regarding the nature of the arrest of David Greengrass? That was right, because David Greengrass himself told me that he did not want to steal uranium. After the interview, I believed him. Did you, in the month of June 1950, or in the month of May 1950, have any passport photographs taken of yourself? I don't recall. I might have had some photos taken. For what purpose might have those photographs been taken? Well, when I walked with the children many times with my wife, we could step in, we would have, we would pass a man in the street with one of those box cameras. He, we would take some pictures. We would step into place and take some pictures, and the pictures we liked, we kept. He is not asking you that. He's asking you about these particular pictures in June 1950. What was the purpose of those pictures? <coughs> just if you take the pictures, you just go in, some pictures, snapshots. Do you remember telling him at, telling the man at 99 Park Row that you had gone to France to settle in a state? I did not tell him anything of that sort. At the time David was talking about going to Mexico, what kind of pictures did you take and how many? I don't recall. Okay, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Rosenberg. Next on the stand is wife and co-defendant, no, Ethel Rosenberg.
strange why. And he's like, yeah, I talked to him, but he never told me. <laughs> Remember, Mr. Greenglass admitted that he stole these diagrams and secrets. He said to pass them to Gold, who was connected to Rosenberg. Rosenberg just testified he didn't know anything about it. He wasn't calling anybody like Elizabeth Bentley said he was. He's like, nope, I don't know her. Never called her. He did not answer if he was a communist. Listen, the Fifth Amendment clearly states that you can decline to answer a question, and you jurors cannot <coughs> use that against him. Keep it in your that mind. Can't be you can't say because he didn't answer he must be a communist. The Fifth Amendment says that's not how it works, and judges remind juries of that, as I am right now. Now, you can use anything else he said against him, but not when he said, I'm not going to answer. So now his wife and co-defendant, Ethel. Did you do all the chores of a housewife? Yes, I did. <laughs> Cooking, washing, cleaning, darning, scrubbing? Yes, I did. Did you hire any help throughout that period? On occasion, for brief periods. I know that when I came from the hospital Pay after the too. birth of the first child, I had some help for the first month. And then upon the time that the second child arrived, I had help for about two months, and there was a period when I was ill, and that started about November 1944. I had to have help right up to about the spring of 1945. Now, outside of these three periods you last mentioned, you did all of the housework yourself? That is right. Your laundry and everything? That is correct. Did you at any time type any matters that that may be called information concerning anything relating to our national defense? No, I didn't. Did you know anything about the charges that had been leveled against your husband by the government in 45? Oh, you mean the time that the government dismissed him? Yes. Well, it was alleged that he was a member of the Communist Party. And he was dismissed for that reason? Well, they gave him that as a reason. That is right. Now, you typed the reply for him, is that right? Yes. And the reply which you typed denied that he was a communist. Now, you typed the reply for him, is that right? Yes. And the reply which you typed denied that he was a communist, is that correct? Yes. Did you know that your brother, David Greenglass, was working on the atom bomb project? No. When did you find out about that for the first time? Oh, when he came out of the army. You mean in 1946? Yes. Block then repeated the Greenglass's testimony about the jello box, remember how they cut it to make it fit? He quoted Greenglass's testimony as to how Julius had said, This half will be brought to you by another party, and he will bear the greetings from me, and you will know what I have sent him. Was there any such thing? Did you ever hear of any such thing as a jello box being cut in two in order to be a means of identification of any emissary or agent to be sent by your husband? out west in order to get information from the Los Alamos project? Outside of this co courtroom, I never heard any such thing. Incidentally, did you have any jello boxes in your apartment? Oh, yes. Now, your sister-in-law testified, in substance, that he had a miscarriage of some time after she had been living with her husband in Albuquerque, Albuquerque, and that she had written you a letter in which she informed you of the fact that she had a miscarriage, and that thereupon she received a response from you and she had a letter ask in writing, third time. in which you said, so, in substance, it. that soon a rel relative will come to visit her and insinuate that that sort of was a signal, or that the word relative had some meaning transmitting to her the idea that somebody was going to come see her and receive information. Did you ever write a letter containing a phrase that a relative would come to see her? No, I did not. Did you ever make an arrangement with her, or did your husband in, in your presence that if the phrase relative would be used in any letter, it would mean as an identifying mark and it would refer to somebody, an emissary or of yours or your husband's concern? coming over to get information. There was never any such talk. Ethel was asked whether Julius ever discovered with her the demand for money made by Greenglass, which was alleged in Julius's testimony. 
Well, the first time he said that Davy had demanded two thousand dollars from him and had seemed pretty upset. Were you worried about it? Yes, I was. Well, forget whether you were worried about it. What did you do about it? Well, I said to my husband, well, doesn't he know the kind of financial situation we're in? Didn't you tell him you can't give him money like that? And then I remember saying something to the effect that if Ruthie Greenglass doesn't stop nagging him for money, she is liable to give him another psychological heart attack like he had in the winter. Ethel testified that Julius told her about another conversation with David Greenglass. Well, this time my husband told me that Davy really must be in some very serious trouble, that he was extremely nervous and agitated, and that he began to talk wildly, threatened that he would be sorry if he didn't. My husband said that David threatened him that he, my husband, would be sorry if that money wasn't forthcoming. What did you say or do about it? Well, I told my husband that I thought I should call the house and find out if everything was all right. And my husband said, well, the only thing is David may be working. He may not even be home. And I have no way of knowing just how much of this Ruthie knows about. And she has really had her hands full between her burns and having given birth to a child. And perhaps it would be wiser if he took it upon himself to see him at the earliest opportunity he could. Did you at any time, either on that occasion or any other occasion, either with words or in substance, ask her to get an assurance from Dave that he was not going to talk, that he was going to claim he was going to be innocent or that the innocent, and that if he does that, everybody will be okay and satisfied? No, I never said any such thing. Uh, did you have any questions taken from any purpose whatsoever in May or June 1960? We may have. We may have. Do you remember when? No, all I remember was some commercial photographer. How did you happen to get before the camera, that camera? Well, my older child was interested in machines, among other things. We, it was our wont to go for walks with them and to stop and look at anything of interest, <coughs> anything that might be of interest to the child and very often as we took these walks the older children particularly would ask, oh come let's go in here and get some, get our pictures taken. That is, I think kids generally do that kind of thing. How many times would you say he had done that? Oh, several times. We happened to be what you would call snapshot hounds. And the bunch of pictures that you saw there doesn't nearly represent all the snapshots and all the photos that we have had made of ourselves and children all through our lives. In other words, if they're alive today, they use a lot of Snapchat selfies, that's what they're saying. Mm. Then you remember, you say, having had some photographs taken in May or June. Or in June. It may have been that time. I am really not sure. There were so many frequent occasions when we dropped into these places. I am talking about the very last ones that you had taken. Well, I can't say what I don't recall, and I really don't recall specifically. Staple. Well, we have it now. We have it now. At least the photographer, the commercial photographer, was within walking distance to you, of your home at 10 Merrill Street. Is that right? Well, there were times we took walks and took photographs elsewhere. Uh, we are now talking about the time that you last remember within these two years when you sent with your family to a commercial photographer to have a picture taken, or pictures. But I didn't say that we took a walk this particular time to this particular place. Where was it? I wouldn't know. Sable asked Ethel whether she helped her brother David Greenglass join the Communist Party. Did you help him join the Communist Party? I refuse to answer. Can you use that against our jury? No. no. I don't care what you think and what your autopilot brain says. You cannot use that as an admission of guilt, because that's her constitutional right to not answer that. At the grand jury hearing, Ethel had been asked whether she had discussed this case with your brother, David Greenglass. 
She refused to answer at that time, pleading her Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate herself. Saifel asked her about this. It was true because my brother David was under arrest. How would that incriminate you if you are correct? In innocent. As long as I had any idea that there might be the chance for me to be incriminated, I had the right to use that privilege. Now let me ask you a question. If you had answered at that time that you had spoken to David for reasons best known to you, you felt that that would incri uh, incriminate you? Well, if I used the privilege of self-incrimination at that time, I must have felt that perhaps there might be something that might incriminate me in answering. As a matter of fact, at that time, you, you didn't know how much the FBI knew about you, and so you weren't talking, taking any chances. Isn't that it? I was using, I don't know, what the FBI knew or didn't know. Of course you didn't. You weren't ta taking any chances in, in no, implicating yourself <coughs> on, your, on your husband. Well, if I answered that, I didn't want to answer the question on the grounds that it might incriminate me. I must have had a reason to think that it might incriminate me. Well, that reason was based on the advice that your lawyer had given you, was it not? My lawyer had advised me of my rights. He advised you only on the bias of what you told him. I can't recall right now what my reasons were at that time for using that right. I said before, and I say again, if I used that right, then I must have had some other, or some reason or other. I cannot recall right now what that reason might or might not have been, depending on the different questions I was asked. That's in her testimony. Thank you. Okay? Now, the order that stuff happens in a trial, if you didn't know this, we had the prosecution come in, call their witness. They told their side of the story. It's like making your case. Then the defense called their witnesses. And was that kind of risky to put the Rosenbergs on the witness stand and let them talk? Yeah. Remember, when they plead the fifth, you cannot use that against them. <coughs> Don't say, well, I know they're lying because they didn't answer. That's their constitutional right. Now, at the very end, they both made their case. What happens before it goes to the jury? Think of it like a five-paragraph essay. Closing remarks. Yes. Each attorney gets to stand up and say, here's like my conclusion before you guys go deliberate and pick if they're guilty. Okay, I remind you the two crimes are charged with. Espionage, that's stealing secrets from your country. And treason, that's giving aid or comfort to your enemy. Okay, the punishment ranges from any prison sentence you would want to give them to life or even death by the electric chair. You guys don't get to decide yet. So we're going to have closing arguments first. Do we have okay. to off, uh, for a closing? You, you do not have to. If you want to do your own thing or summarize, you can. That's why. Do you have your little handout? If you need a sec, Mr. Block, to channel your inner creative juices, I can stall for a second. Um, you tell me when you're ready. How about that? Mr. McKelkey. Yes. Hustle. He's going to go first, so while he's doing his, I told him, like, you can summarize it, put your own spin on it, disregard it completely, and say what you want. Here's what you always say at the end. You're talking to the jury. Here's why you have to find both Ethel and Julius guilty of treason and espionage and give them the death sentence. Bringing up past evidence that stuck out in your mind, the stuff that looks bad for him, whatever you can use. He's going to do the opposite, right? Acquit him because, okay, just keep it to like not more than five minutes because we're going to have time to end, right? Because I know you can do this for like three hours and do a great job. Okay, so jury, first, Mr. Block, do not make up your mind yet. Wait till you hear from both of them, then you get to deliberate. Okay, so here's the defense's closing argument. Men and women of the jury, when given the outlook on life, and when you look upon the beautiful faces of Mr. and Mrs. Rosenberg, Communist. beautiful family, with two beautiful children. And you think to yourself, would I, a member 
and citizen of the United States want to convict a worthy citizen <coughs> into death, possibly, by an electric chair. I don't know if any of you have read the new hit book by Stephen King, The Green Mile. This just came out last year, 1924, that a black man was falsely convicted for things that he did and was sent to the electric chair. It's a very eye-opening story about how the jury and the way the facts are introduced in the state of court can be falsely acquitted and innocent people can be taken and sentenced to death. Now, I've got a couple more points I'd like to make. Ruth Greenglass got out. She walked out and put her sister-in-law in. Ooh. It was a deal that the Green Glasses planned and made for themselves, and they made it. They may not have made it by express agreement with the government, and I don't think the government would countenance anything like that. But tell me, do actions speak louder than words? Is the proof of the pudding in the eating? <laughs> Is Ruth Greenglass a, def a defendant here? And ladies and gentlemen, this explains why David Greenglass was willing to bury his sister and his brother-in-law to save his wife. Yes, there were other factors, of course. He had a grudge against Rosenberg because he felt that Rosenberg had gypped him out of a thousand dollars. A thousand measly dollars. <laughs> but that would not have been enough to explain Greenglass's act. Not only are the Green Glasses self-conscious spies, but they were mercenary spies. They spied for money. They would do anything for money. They would murder people for money. They are trying to murder people <laughs> for money. <laughs> now for God's sake, you are intelligent people. Do you believe, or have you ever heard, that a government cites somebody without making public the citation? And do you believe? Sometimes. <laughs> or have you ever heard that a government cites somebody without making the citation? <laughs> and do you believe that this little guy indicated? with the little business, this terribly wealthy man who hasn't got a dime to his name, that he was cited by the Russian government. Do you believe that? For God's sake, convict the Rosenbergs, and let's get an end to this case. <laughs> Am I the only one? Uh, that? <laughs> yeah, that Did you just listen to what you just said? Convict him and let's be over with it. <laughs> That's literally what you just said. Convict them means find them guilty. Acquit them means let them go. <laughs> really? I agree. Unless he's being sarcastic with that statement, I don't know. It is sarcasm. So continue because you didn't let me finish <laughs> my statement. I'm pretty sure that's how it went. But if you don't believe it, then take a lot of other things with salt in these green glasses said in their anxiety to bury the Rosenbergs. Now is what you conclude very simply. I told you at the beginning and I tell you now that we don't come to you in this kind of charge looking for sympathy. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, there is plenty of room here for a lawyer, lawyer to try to harp on your emotions, especially so far as Ethel Rosenberg is concerned. A mother. She has two children. Her husband is under arrest. No. Because if these people are guilty of that crime, they deserve no sympathy. No, we want you to decide this case with your minds. Not with your hearts, with your minds. I say that if you do that, you can come to no other conclusion that these de defendants, are defendants. defendants are innocent and you are going to show to the world that in America, a man can get a fair trial. Thank you. And women. Okay, thank you. Now, closing.
arguments from the prosecutor, Mr. Saple, and then jury, you will deliberate. Uh, Don't make wait. up your mind yet. No matter what you think, be open-minded until they're both done. All right, so <laughs> what year is this going? What year is the trial in? Uh, 1951, I believe. When did Russia test off their first nuke? 1949. Okay. So they've had the bomb for two years now. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, here's why... The Rosenbergs are guilty for what they're doing. I'm not going to go over that speech there because it's really long and eventually I'm going to have to write this letter, but let's use some common sense here. The Russians now have nukes. We don't know anybody, but through the Venona Project and whatnot, we found out that some people have been supplying information to the Russians or the communists from the United States. Now, who is that? Through our investigation, we figured out it was these two. The Russians have had these bombs for two years showing that they have the bombs, and since they have the bombs, they got the information from somewhere, and seeing as how these two people were both con er, not convicted, that's what I'm looking for, conspired with David Greenglass, who was one of the people working on the uh, atom bomb project, they obviously had the information. On top of that, if you continue to think that David Greenglass is a bad guy who's just lying and doing whatever, then maybe that is true, but at the same time, he is getting a deal from the government, and that maybe in your mind that might be a bad thing, but at the same time, he has no reason to lie at this point, because if he lies, what's the point in that? He has no reason to lie, but meanwhile, the Rosenbergs have every reason to lie, because if they get convicted here and now, they could be put to death. I'm not saying that they should be put to death, but I say that their trial should be worthy of the crime. Okay. Okay, now listen carefully. Jury, you guys are going to step out in the hallway. Okay, when you come back, here's what you're going to tell us. You vote down the line for both Julius, because that's separate, and Ethel. Which one? Neither both you think is guilty, and then we'll pick a punishment. You guys, go to Canvas if you're still in here. Honestly, not, I don't think either of them should have been tried guilty. Don't back down, brother. You know it's guilty. Okay. We're betraying the country. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. Go to Canvas. This Rosenberg trial assignment. You'll see this is the last thing that we're doing this week. It's through Sunday at midnight. I spiced it up a little bit. You will see a picture of Robert Mirapol. That is the younger son of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Last name's different because basically when your parents are the highest profile spy case in American history and they get put to death, you're kind of a black sheep kind of person being their kids. And so um, family members were taking care of them, but the school actually kicked them out. And so they got adopted by the Miracle family. Robert and Michael are their two sons. They're both... I mean, I don't know how old they are, in their 60s probably. 69 we, to 73. We could do some math. They're both uh, very intelligent. Um, one's a professor of economics, and one is a professor of something else. They're highly educated. There is an article they wrote about six months ago about why their mother was really innocent and that the FBI should basically go back and say, we made a mistake by executing her. Okay. I'm not going to tell you what to think, but based on the evidence, the Venona Project, the Red Scare, one of the big themes yesterday was, can you get a fair trial if your community is vehemently opposed to that crime you're accused of? No. No. And we know what Americans thought about communists in the early 1950s. So, thank you, here's what you're going to do. You're going to write their son a letter, because the real jury found him guilty of espionage and treason, and the judge sentenced them to death and said, I cannot find it in my heart to forgive you for what you've done. You could have caused hundreds of millions of deaths if a nuclear holocaust happens. Now, we know today it didn't happen, but obviously people were worried about that in the 1950s. You're going to write Robert a letter. I have his address and his fax number. You can pick how to send it. I have some ideas for questions that you could explain. Basically this. How did they get convicted? Because in, in history, they were found guilty. What evidence you heard or read about do you think hurt their case? 
what about the climate and the media at the time hurt their case? Because we said yesterday that matters. Okay? And do you believe the verdict of guilty for both Ethel and Julius was just? Was it fair? Okay? Do you think they deserve the death penalty, especially her? The only thing she was accused of, if you listen to the testimony, was what? Typing. Typing. Okay? And at the grand jury before the real trial, allegedly, no one even mentioned that. So your defense attorney said they just made that up to incriminate you as well. Even so, that's all she was accused of was typing the secrets while Greenblatt and Julius talked. Okay? Do you think the world was more or less safe once the Soviets got nuclear technology and became an atomic power? Totally your opinion. Tell him what you think. Because that was Julius's main motivation, we said, right? If both superpowers have atomic weapons, they will be less likely to use them for fear of the other. But if there's only one atomic power, that country can use it indiscriminately and there is no deterrent. Remember what history tells us about that question. Because for four years, we were the only nuclear power. Did we use atomic weapons? Twice. Yes. Since the Soviets got this technology, has anyone used nuclear weapons on purpose? No. Okay, and then anything else you want to say to him, it should not go over a page. It's due in Canvas Sunday night. I have envelopes up here, or you can fax it in the office. I don't care how you send it. Have fun.